guys, uh, it kind of happens that this is kind of one of my favorite subjects to teach about is the Battle of Britain. Um, as, as I noted yesterday, um, I've written a couple of pretty large papers on this. And um, the one that um, really stood out to me was the one on, you know, you have 48 million Britons that are going to be under assault for more than six months. And every citizen, every child is going to be impacted by this. And I think it's just an interesting study in how they tried to defend their nation uh, from fascism and from the onslaught in World War II. And, uh, uh, and so I got some really good stories, but I'm going to start with a couple of videos. I did show you guys the one on um, uh, the Dunkirk shots of the Stuka dive bombers coming in. That's one of these. And one of them doesn't work. So uh, I'm going to show you two videos here. One that uh, many of you have probably seen before. Okay. Um, but we'll go, let's go with this one. And this, guys, is a uh, dogfight between a Messerschmitt and a Spitfire. And this is what it would look like in 1940 um, over the skies of southern Britain, okay? And what's interesting, guys, is usually the weather there is cloudy, it's, it's rainy. Uh, that summer and fall, uh, oftentimes the skies were clear. So uh, that had made it easier, <coughs> excuse me, for the defense of Britain uh, because the, the British, the RAF pilots could see the Germans and they weren't obstructed by clouds. So, uh, maybe some divine intervention there. We'll see. Maybe. Oh, my God. <laughs> The German thinks he's in the free and clear, but he's not. Really, kind of see the uh, the landscape there of southern England, and this one, which you guys have probably seen. There's several things I'm going to talk about that you'll see in this video.
Okay. Everybody's seen that movie, haven't they? No. no. Really? What? No. Oh, you should watch it definitely. The, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, it's the only Narnia movie that's like super famous. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. Did they add the spotlights? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about all that, right? So I got pictures of a lot of this. Um, I mentioned this to you guys yesterday that Churchill stayed um, in uh, London during the Blitz, okay? And actually, if you go to London today, um, there's something called the War Cabinet Rooms. Um, it's very inconspicuous. Uh, you, you look at, um, you got this row of apartments, and it ends, and there's like a park, okay? And... You go around the side of the apartments, down around underneath, and you go down the stairs, and this is where Churchill ran the war in the middle of London uh, during the Blitz and after and so forth. When the war ended, they left the war cabinet rooms exactly as they were. So the big map room in there, you'll find Churchill's bed. Okay, so he slept in the, in the room there. Uh, he liked to work late at night. Uh, into the night, and he was a drinker, so he would, you know, have his scotch and his cigar, and he'd be in there. He'd sleep uh, and work from bed uh, until about one o'clock, uh, and then he'd get up and move around. Okay, he's he's a strange cat. I think I have, yeah, I have it here. I'll pass this around. Um, it's got pictures of the war cabinet room, um, and it's it's kind of a cool place to visit if you go there. Um, and so, like, the, yeah, everything's exactly as it was at the end of the war. So Churchill, you can see here in this picture, this is after a bombing raid in London. He's out amongst the people. And I talked about this with the, you know, the royal family stayed in London. Uh, this is good for morale because there are a lot of people that want to quit. They, you know, they want this bombing to stop. And uh, the fact that Churchill and the royal family are there with them, it's good for morale for the country. You know what I mean? They could have fled. They could have gone to a safer location, but they didn't, okay? Um, there's that great picture of Churchill uh, looking like a mobster. And then that quote I mentioned yesterday, uh, never in the course of human conflict have so many owed so much to so few, uh, the, the RAF pilots, okay? Uh, i got a picture of the kids here. Um, I, I told you guys, like, when Poland was invaded, that's when they started sending the children off to the countryside. But no bombs fell for like seven, eight months uh, on Britain. And so a lot of the kids were impatient. They wanted to go back to see their families, uh, see their mom and dad. Um, and so some of them ran away. Uh, quite a few actually ran away, went back to the cities and looked for mom and dad. Well, they weren't there. Dad was off in the army somewhere. And mom was working in a factory somewhere. And so you had these bands of kids, which in proper term in, in Britain is hooligans, uh, running around terrorizing people, stealing food, robberies, and stuff like this. We're talking about six, seven, eight, nine-year-old kids with no parents, okay? And the infrastructure as far as taking care of, you know, kids and stuff like that, well, everybody's working. Everybody
everybody's, you know, trying to prepare for the war, digging people out of, you know, out of homes and so forth. So um, as I go to the next slide, talk about some of what we saw in the video, okay? And you've, I don't know if you guys have seen pictures of these balloons before, okay? Um, there, there's actually a name for them called, they're, they're called barrage balloons, okay? And so um, if you're a German pilot flying over Britain in the sky during the daylight, can you avoid these things? I mean, like, you're not going to run into them, right? <laughs> so they don't really serve that purpose. The real purpose of these barrage balloons is this thing right here. This is a steel cable, okay? And so what the British did is they put these things up around strategic locations. And remember the Stuka dive bomb? When they come in and hit a target, they go in a steep dive right over the target. If you put these things around radar stations, important buildings, airfields, stuff like that, then the dive bombers are not going to want to go into those steel cables. Because what happens is if a wing of a plane hits one of these, it's going to do one of two things. It's going to rip the wing off or send the plane into a spin. Okay, Because what's going to happen down here is a parachute is going to pop out and create drag against that. So you got the balloon here and you got this it's creating drag. And, you know, it's going to bring the plane down. How often does that happen? Not very often. Okay, especially because German pilots, dive bombers, did not want to dive down them. So they did play an effective role. Another role they played is, guys, just knowing every day when you woke up after a bombing raid, you could look in the sky and know that, hey, we're trying to do something to defend ourselves. Okay, there'd be like five people that would be in charge of putting up each balloon. At the height of the war, Britain had over 2,100 of these balloons flying in the sky over Britain. Okay, we actually had some of these on the west coast of the United States after Pearl Harbor. Okay, we put up some barrage balloons in the United States. Um, you could also see these uh, on top of ships as well, like, you know, ships at sea having these barrage balloons up to avoid dive bombers. Um, the other thing that's kind of effective with these, so you saw a bombing raid at night. The German pilots are going to want to fly at an altitude above these balloons at night. So if the British strategically place these balloons on top of buildings, get them up higher, uh, because what you saw there was fairly low-level bombing. And so um, the German pilots are flying at a certain altitude. Well, the guns that they're shooting at them with, the British called ak ak guns. The Germans had the 88 German flat gun, right? But the British had the ak ak gun. And so when you get those shells to explode at a certain altitude, you have a better idea what altitude that is at night based on how high the barrage balloons are set. Does that make sense? Making your anti-aircraft fire maybe a little bit more effective, okay? Um, oh, in the, in the video, um, of Narnia video, you saw them go to the backyard, okay? And this is what's called an Anderson shelter. And the government would provide this to anybody that wanted one. And so basically you dig a hole in your backyard about three feet deep, and you just kind of bolt this together. Now, you could make these as nice as you wanted or as rugged as you wanted. The, the one in the movies, like, they had, like, rugs and carpet on the floor. And, you know, it was kind of nice, okay? Most of them weren't that nice, right? But you don't want to be in your house during a bombing raid. Because if the, if, if the house collapses, you're probably going to die. So you have a much better chance of survival during an air raid by going in your backyard and going into the shelter, okay? Now, today, you can go to London today and still see these in people's backyards that have gardens built around them and stuff like that, okay? But most of them were, didn't have, you know, hard floors. It was muddy. It rained a lot. You know, they weren't real nice places to go, but it may save your life, okay? The Germans like to use incendiary bombs, uh, ones that would cause fires. Uh, they would do that sometimes during low tide. So you're using uh, water from the river and so forth. Uh, and 
that makes it more difficult to put out these fires. Uh, but, you know, they had big fire crews uh, during the blitz and so forth. Right? As we go forward, I have four more pictures here. Let's talk about this one. Uh, if you had enough money, guys, steel is hard to come by during the war. But if you had enough money, you could buy one of these. It's a steel, basically, box. You put some uh, chicken wire up. And put a mattress in it, and you can sleep in your home during an air raid. Um, and if the house collapses, this, this steel box will not collapse. Okay, and they'll just have to dig you out. But you didn't have to go outside in your Anderson shelter. You stay in your Morrison shelter. Okay. Speaking of shelter, uh, they did have air raid shelters for people, but not enough in the big cities. So this is the tube in London underground, uh, the, the subway. And um, the government really discouraged people from going into these uh, during the air raids because these are only built a few feet under the ground. Um, so, like, if a 500-pound bomb hits, you know, it, this whole thing could collapse. And it did. That did happen. Thankfully, not a lot. But there were instances where these tubes did collapse because of bombs that hit the ground. Okay. And then at night, of course, we've got the we've got the blackouts, right? And you asked about the, the spotlights. Once you hear the planes, you know, the air, the sirens go off. Um, now you go into defensive mode. Um, they found the city. So you, you're, you know they're there anyway. So they're going to go ahead and turn on the spotlights and try and help the gunners, the ACAT gunners. And this is this is the German anti or the. British anti-aircraft gun. Uh, they always come up with funny names, the British do. Uh, and that using the spotlights uh, would help make them, uh, you know, locate the, the bombers, hopefully, and shoot them down. Uh, and then this is the radar stations that you would see all along the coast of Britain. Okay, it's primitive. Uh, it's not, you know, we have these big dishes now that, you know, circle around for radar, uh, Doppler radar, radar, and so forth. Um, but yeah, so they had to protect those, um, and oftentimes they did with barrage balloons. Uh, so on this slide, uh, you got the ACAT gun, and, and you would have a, a couple people see this one's actually on, on uh, wheel on, on tracks. Um, so you know, they, they invested a lot in the defense of the country here. Um, I don't know, you guys ever seen one of these, like in Wichita? Somebody said Warren Theater downtown sometimes does this, does the spotlight. Yeah, and you can yeah. see it from all over the city when they do them. I, know, I think Spangles used to use them when they'd open a new restaurant and stuff. But um, they're kind of cool to see in the skies, uh, the, the lights like that. Uh, and then you can see the kids here, guys. Uh, right here and here again, uh, these are gas masks uh, that every British citizen that wanted a gas mask was given a gas mask. You know, we have people wearing masks today. We, you know, we, we've all been, you know, had to wear masks. This is different. You know what I mean? Like, these are bulky, uh, and, and they did drills. You know what I mean? Like, at, at school, they did drills uh, of putting on your gas mask as soon as you, can, as soon as you can. Um, it's, it's frightening for children to have to go through this. Uh, it's frightening for people. Uh, thankfully, the Germans did not use poisonous gas in World War II. Okay, um, but they were fearful that they would drop bombs with, you know, gas and so forth. Uh, and like I said, thankfully they didn't. Um, and so these cute little British kids here uh, all get shipped off. They get an ID tag, suitcase, gas mask, and send them away. A lot of these kids never saw their parents again. So, um, all
and hopefully if a German plane came in, the wing would hit it and deter it from, you know, bombing the airfield. And all the research I did on these parachute cables, I only found one time where it actually worked. <laughs> so they spent a lot of time and money to, you know, and it actually ripped the wing uh, of the plane off. The German pilot crashed, survived the crash, and the townspeople came out and grabbed it. Okay. Uh, it was kind of an interesting, I was in some random book I found uh, over at Wichita State Library. But yeah, a parachute will deploy here as well. If it hits, the wing hits it and creates that drag like this picture here. And then the Germans got creative and they tried to cut through the steel cable. They put, put these on the front of some of their planes. That, it didn't work too good for this one. Okay. <laughs> this one was shot down or came down uh, as a result of hitting the cable. Now, as you saw in the dogfight video between the Messerschmitt and the Spitfire, the, the cliffs of England, the white cliffs of England, yeah? Okay, so do you think if the Germans were going to make an amphibious landing, they would land where those cliffs are. No, and the British know that. So those are areas they don't have to really defend. So, but they did know the areas they did have to defend in case they came with landing craft to invade the country, okay? And in those areas, you also have tributaries, rivers that come up um, into London. Uh, in those areas, say over here, you guys know what PVC pipe is? It's like white PVC pipe, uh, plastic. They drilled holes in it, little holes in it, and then they put the, the PVC pipe out into the surf, into the water, where the German craft would be coming. And I'm really glad the Germans didn't think of this, like on D-Day. What they did is they would pump oil into the PVC pipe, and it would leak out and cover the surface of the water. So if the German crafts approached, all they had to do was ignite it. And those, those boats, would, you know, they would incinerate. Great idea. Not very environmentally friendly, okay? But it could stop an invasion. And this is them practicing that right here, okay, just in case, all right? Now, as far as the rivers go, these tributaries. Now, I know you guys live in Kansas. You guys are all Kansas. Okay, but if you're ever on a body of water and you see this sticking out of the water, what is it? It's a buoy, okay? There's red buoys and there's green buoys. And if you're driving a boat, you stay between the red and the green buoy. If you go outside the buoy, you're getting into shallow water and your boat's going to hit the ground. And you're going to stop really fast. Been there, done that. Okay? Now, this looks harmless, this buoy, but underneath the buoy is a platform with some pontoons that are filled with water. And then in case the German Navy comes up the river, you pump the water out, and this thing comes out of the sea, and you got machine gun and artillery nests up here, and you can destroy their Navy, like this. These are, there's still one of these out, out there today. I don't know if you guys heard the story about the guy that uh, climbed up on this thing and claimed it as his own country. Yeah. You heard about that? Yeah. Okay. So that's what that is, okay? Um, What's it made of? Uh, that looks like concrete, um, but I'm not sure. It's pretty thick. And on top, it just looks like a red, a little red Well, yeah, I mean, you would just see, you know, at the top, you wouldn't really see much, you know. And then if they were coming, you could. Yeah. I'm not done. Okay, now, in case, in case the Germans used paratroopers, okay, the British tore down every street sign in the country. So, like, where it says Wichita, 30 miles this direction, you don't see those signs. So, when the Germans land, they have no landmarks, you know what I mean, to, to see where they are. The other thing about Britain is they have a lot of golf courses. 
Okay. You guys know what dragon's teeth are? Okay, so like with tank warfare, the only way to stop a tank is to put something in its way that it can't go through. You know what I mean? That it can't, it can go over small trees and stuff like that and, you know, hills and all that. So you put these, well, you guys see them all the time. Like at Target or at Walmart, they have these things out front so you can't drive your car through the front door. Yeah, it's kind of a, that's what a dragon's teeth, is, but it's they're big, big concrete things that you can't, and you want in a long area, you can't get tanks through there. Okay. And so, and they, you know, that's expensive to do. It takes a lot of concrete. And the British didn't have time to do that. So they just went to the junkyard and they got old cars and trucks and buses and refrigerators. And they lined the golf courses with this junk to put up barriers. So if, you know, the Germans landed tanks, they wouldn't be able to break out across the golf courses, which are wide open. Okay. So that was all, I mean, that was all done in preparation. You had the home guard that made sure that blackouts were, were effective. Um, and then every, all the teams that ran the spotlights and the barrage balloons and so forth. And then, you know, the, the whole thing with the, uh, the air, the air defense system was amazing for 1940 technology, the way they were prepared for the Germans when they came across. And so the Germans never achieved that air superiority. Hitler's frustrated as hell, okay? Hermann Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, throws his hands up in the air and says, I, I don't know what to do. And so if they don't have air superiority over the English Channel, they're not gonna invade, okay? And they never achieved it, so Hitler will basically give up on Britain, okay, saving the day so that when we get involved, we have a, we have a launching pad, okay, to liberate Europe, okay, and it's, it's an important story. It's one of the most important stories of the 20th century, okay. It stopped fascism, all right. It's one of those, one of those important moments, all right. So we're going to come back across the pond. It's time for another presidential election. It's 1940. And we're going to have something that's never happened before. The president run for a third term. And win. Do the Republicans have any chance here? Not really. Okay. We're still in the Depression, but things are getting kind of hairy. Now, this is one of the good things is that the Republicans and Democrats could agree on defense, okay, of, of this country. And so Republicans and Democrats both favor starting the military draft, or what's formerly known as conscription. Okay, to be conscripted is to be drafted, all right? So we're going to start drafting 18 to 35-year-olds up to 900,000, okay? Traditionally, as I think I've told you guys, we tend to have a small standing army during peacetime. Large Navy, strong Navy, but a small army. Okay, And we showed ourselves during World War I that we could mobilize the war in a very short period of time. Okay, Now, we know we're already building more naval ships. We're already building aircraft. Okay, So we're prepping. Now we've got to equip and train soldiers just in case, which is smart, I think, because just in case is going to happen, right? Now, did we have, at the time, enough guns for 900,000 men? No. Nope. <laughs> so we have to start making the stuff, you know what I mean? And so it helped prepare us. Now, they did realize fairly quickly, guys, that drafting men in their late 20s and early 30s was not a good idea. Why? Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, they have families. They may be important members of the community, right? Like they own businesses and stuff like that that are vital to the home front. And a lot of them are out of shape. <laughs> overweight and out of shape, okay? So, uh, yeah, they scaled that way back, okay, down to like 25, all right? And so what you mostly see in World War II, <clears throat> Korea, and Vietnam 
is your 18, 18 year olds, your 19 year olds. Those are the ones that get drafted. Um, which makes sense. I mean, it's sad if you're 18 at the time and hard on your family. Now, a lot of people volunteered as well. Uh, I think I, uh, let me pull up. I'll pull up the Electoral College map. So you can see uh, Mr. Wilkie um, got trounced. Um, now, Alf Landon only won Vermont and Maine, the governor of Kansas. Uh, so you can see Wilkie did quite a bit better. There's not a lot of electoral college votes here in the Great Plains. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a landslide, like 448. That's uh, so like 89 something like that. Okay. We good here? Good? Okay. So Britain's in trouble. And let me tell you something, guys. Churchill is bugging the new you-know-what out of Roosevelt. He's like, FDR, we need help. FDR, when are you getting in the war? We need you to get in the war. We need help. Please help us. Okay. So literally, he is a pest, uh, Churchill is. And now we are supplying, trying to supply Britain. But what is happening is those supplies are being sunk in the Atlantic. Here's a pretty staggering number, guys. During World War II, over 4,600 merchant ships will be sunk in the Atlantic. 4,600. And who was sinking those with what? Germany with U boats. Unterbolten. <laughs> Unterbolten. German submarine. Okay. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen any submarine movies. Oh, the best. No. Yes. <laughs> the best submarine movie ever is The Hunt for Red. Now, that's a Cold War movie, but if you want to look for World War II, uh, you've got one called uh, U-571. Ladies, Matthew McConaughey. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, Hunt for Red October's got Alec Baldwin and Sean Connery. I know. Freaking awesome. Okay. Uh, there's another one called Das Boot, okay. which is German translated. Okay. Uh, they're both good. They're both. But U571 is a really cool story. Um, it's, a, it's about an American crew that takes over a German submarine, uh, and they try, they're trying to get uh, the Enigma machine. Uh, that the Germans, their code machine, which I'll talk about later. Okay, uh, so it's a pretty good movie. There's uh, three different uh, Kriegsmarine uh, types of German U-boats here that you can see. So these supplies keep dropping to the bottom of the Atlantic, and Churchill's saying to Roosevelt, "Hey, can you like use your navy to help escort these ships across the Atlantic?" And Roosevelt, "No, man, I can't do that because if we use our navy." Our Navy's going to get attacked, and we're going to be drawn into the war. And Churchill's like, yeah, that's great. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Roosevelt's like, no, we can't. And so they, they devise a deal. Okay. We're going to give them some old destroyers from World War I. Okay. And they're going to give us the use of naval air bases, uh, eight of them, and give us 99-year leases to use these air and naval bases. Okay. So it's a trade. We're not going to use these World War I destroyers, okay? So um, here, here it is, okay? We're going to give them 50 
World War I destroyers will receive eight naval and air bases. And if any of these, if the British fall to the Germans, if they're defeated by the Germans, Churchill promises he'll destroy the ships so they can't be used against us. You know, kind of like he did with the French. Now, when I was doing a little more research on this, I found a great website, okay, that uh, tells you what these bases were and actually what happens to all 50 of these um, destroyers during the war, what they were used for and uh, what their, you know, their fate was. Some of, many of them survived the war, uh, but some of them were, did not. We're actually going to give some of these eventually to the Soviets. To the Russians, they will use some of these ships as well once Hitler invades the Soviet Union. Yeah. Destroyers are ships? Yeah, I'll show you a picture here as soon as uh, our note takers get, get going here a little bit. And they were used to, like, for merchant? To, uh, yeah, to help escort the, the merchant ships across the Atlantic. I'll just click on the All right, I'll put this back up. All right, so these are the naval air stations, uh, Antigua, British Guiana, Jamaica, San Lucia, Bermuda, Newfoundland, and Trinidad. Okay, so we get 99-year leases to use these uh, bases. This is what the destroyers look like, okay? And um, they were just sitting on mothballs in, in Annapolis. We weren't going to use them, um, and so we traded, okay? And so you go through these. Um, so like these here, they survived the war. In 1947, they were broken up used for scrap metal. Okay? Uh, but like this one here, the Buchanan, which was renamed, they were all renamed, the Campbellton Town, she was chosen for the raid on St. Nazarene, France, packed with explosives, the ship, was rammed into the gate of the Normandy dry dock at St. Nazarene. When the charges went off, the dry dock gate was blown off, and the dock was rendered unusable, unusable by the Germans. Okay, so it's kind of like, all right, get it going in that direction, jump off the boat, boom. Okay, it's kind of a fun mission to be on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, as we scroll down here, guys, what you're going to see is um, some of these, like here, uh, the Broadwater uh, was sunk by U-boat 101, the Stanley by U-571. The Bath, sunk by U-204, okay? This one sunk by U-952. And others, um, this one struck a mine, okay? And you can see quite a few of these went to the Russians, okay? So this one was the Thomas, then it was the St. Albans, and then it was the Dostoni. Okay? Which is kind of interesting, yeah? Here's your 50 ships. Now, some people were not happy about this. Uh, the America's first crowd that didn't want us to get involved, they're like, Britain, this is Britain's war, this is not us, okay? But Roosevelt's going to uh, try and help the British ship, okay? And... Um, this will go a long way to helping getting those supplies across uh, the Atlantic. I'll get into some details uh, after Pearl Harbor about the Battle of the Atlantic, about how we hunt these submarines and so forth, um, which would be crucial. When I talked about the importance of air superiority during World War II, the other majorly important strategic factor is supply lines. Guys, we have to be able to get our supplies across the Atlantic safely because soon on those ships are going to be our most valuable cargo, which will be our troops braving the Atlantic to go to Europe. Okay, And if those ships get sunk, we're in big trouble. Okay, This is why smart people are in Okay, because we're going to figure out a way to, to, to fight these submarines. Okay? But I don't want to spoil it. So I got a good slide on it down the road. Okay? All right. Yeah, uh, 
that's it for today, I guess. Um, that's how far I got. Did we do this slide? No. Yeah, we do one slide. Yeah. <laughs> that's our tradition. We do. This goes right along with the, the destroyer for bases deal. Okay. And this is what you read in the textbooks. Okay. All the textbooks have this. Okay. The lend lease act. Okay. So the U.S. begins to lend or lease supplies to Britain for later payment. Remember this during World War One? Yeah. yeah. All the money we gave the Allies and what we got back. <laughs> Finland paid us back, right? Now we are expecting to be paid for this again. Okay. Now, what's important to remember here, guys, um, the lend lease will help the British, but it is also going to be extended to the Russians, the Soviets. Again, that won't be until Hitler invades <laughs> Russia. Okay. Then they will become our ally. Okay. So down the road. And Lend-Lease is also going to extend to the Chinese, who was our, our ally in World War II, Chinese, okay? And this is one of those parts of World War II that it has probably the least amount of scholarship on, like books written, movies made, is um, the fact that American and Chinese troops actually fought together in World War II, okay? It's, it's not something that um, there's a lot of literature um, I had an interview with a student that a student did, this is probably 15 years ago, with a guy that fought in Burma alongside the Chinese, okay, against the Japanese, which was fascinating. So, before long, we're getting close here, guys, U.S. ships are going to be delivering supplies, U.S. merchant ships. Those U.S. merchant ships are going to come under attack. Is this enough to drive us to war? No. <laughs> okay. This is where you get the merchant marines. Okay. So we start arming our ships, uh, our merchant ships. And any volunteers want to go across the Atlantic? We'll give you some guns. We shoot at the Germans. Yes. We need some merchant marines. Sure, Grandpa. Why not? Have any of you guys seen Captain uh, Captain Phil? Yeah, yeah. The uh, uh, Somali pirates? Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, they have different defenses now, but like you can pull up some YouTube videos of uh, merchant ships fighting off uh, Somali pirates. <laughs> yes. Uh, now, this is important. Look at this. Churchill and Roosevelt will meet in person. Churchill's going to brave the Atlantic, which is dangerous, okay, to come visit Roosevelt. Now, the American people don't know about this meeting. This is top secret. They're going to meet up in Newfoundland, up in uh, Canada, okay? And as you can see, they're sitting down. For good reason, yes, okay? <coughs> and um, it is at this, this meeting where it is discussed what's going to happen once the United States is in the war. We know it's going to happen at some point. And so they begin to strategize how we attack this war. Okay. Now, as you guys know, we will not be attacked at Pearl Harbor by Germany, but by Japan. Yes. So the American people are going to want blood. They want Japanese blood. Okay, what's interesting is after Pearl Harbor, we don't declare war on Germany. Germany declares war on us three days later after we declare war on Japan because they are allies. Okay, but it is decided here that once the U.S. is in the war, we will focus on Europe first and wait on the Pacific. Okay, that's decided so they can start making plans for once we get in. Okay. Now, guys, one of the most effective ways to get supplies across the Atlantic was in convoys. Okay, so you can see this large group of ships. Kind of looks like the west coast of the United States today. With the supply chain issues. You know how many ships are waiting to go into port right now? 175 cargo ships are waiting outside off the coast of California. They can't get in. Okay. Fine. 
the docks. There's not enough workers, and they're they're not going 24 hours a day. Now they're going to try and transition to 24 hours a day, okay? And then having enough truck drivers, okay? So look, look, you can't drive a truck in California to these docks unless it's a truck that's made after 2011. Environmental issues. They don't want the old trucks that pollute more in California, okay? You can't drive a truck into these ports in California unless you're part of the truckers' union. So if you're a private trucker, you're not allowed to use the ports in California. Okay, so it's California policies that are leading to this. Other factors are we are importing more goods than we ever have from China and from overseas, more, more than we ever have, okay? Now, the cost of a, to ship a container from China has gone from $3,000 a container to $6,000 a container, okay? Because those ships are having to wait for weeks to get into port, so they're not making money, so they're charging a lot more. What's going to happen to the price of these goods that are on these on these cargo ships, they're going up. Everything's going up. So inflation is going to continue to rise. Okay. Um, this is a bigger problem than they're actually letting on. Okay. Uh, now, if they go to 24 hours and relax some of the standards, you know, our, our truck drivers have a limited amount of time they're allowed to drive in a 24 hour period. You know, there's restrictions on that for safety reasons, right? I heard this yesterday on the radio. That if they increase the amount of time a trucker can drive by every trucker in America by 17 minutes a day, we could put a big dent in this this log jam. Okay, but it, it, California rules are making it very difficult. Um, so we'll see how this gets handled over the next. You know, it's been a week since President Biden talked about it. Um, See if they can get those up and running 24 hours a day. Uh, but there's there's going to be certain products you're just not going to be able to buy. Okay. And as the Washington Post said, hey, just lower your expectations and it won't bother you. Too. Okay. It's it's the new normal. Okay. No, it's not that big a deal. Okay. You can't get your treadmill. You can't get your refrigerator. Sorry, you're going to have to wait six months. Okay. What's that? Right now. It's it's really hard to do. Very expensive. Yeah. Okay, guys. That's it for today. My thing is tilting really bad. Yeah.